invite you to take your Bible and stand if you're able, and I'll read verses 1 through 10. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils? And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And so ends the reading of God's holy word. Let me pray. It is with thanksgiving that we receive your word, our Father. May it be our rule. May your spirit be our teacher and your greater glory our supreme concern through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, already we have seen Melchizedek's name appear on just a few occasions in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we have not uh, mentioned much to that. But we've simply noted that we'll eventually get to it, and we are there now. We noted it at chapter 5, verse 6, when it was first mentioned, quoting from that great Messianic Psalm 110, verse 4. And then at chapter 5, verse 10, he hits it again. But then at chapter 5, verse 11, he says, I'm not going to talk with you about Melchizedek right now because you're just too spiritually sluggish. And so the writer threw out those hints and then withdrew it because he understood his people weren't quite ready. Well, now it comes to chapter 7. And he wants to test once again their spiritual fortitude. Were they still sluggish? Were they dull of hearing? Or would they hear the word of the Lord and understand something about this figure, Melchizedek? And it is interesting that how indeed that we too hear Hebrews 7 is very telling about us. Are we eager and passionate to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that God has revealed Him? Or are we too somewhat spiritually dull or sluggish when it comes to hearing the Word of the Lord are you passionate to get down and, and do the hard work of lifting and digging to try to understand passionately just who Jesus is in all of his glory? For as the psalmist said, he is the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And yet, it's very important this morning that we don't get lost in Melchizedek. 
Because this chapter in the final analysis is not about Melchizedek. This chapter is about our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You may recall that earlier in chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews told us he was going to write about Jesus Christ as both our apostle and the high priest of our lives. He is the apostle that God sent to do what neither Moses nor Joshua could give to the people in their day, real spiritual rest and the salvation of the Lord God Almighty that we find ultimately in Jesus Christ. And now, having described that apostle, he is going to say to us, for the bulk of the letter now, all the way through chapter 10, that this Jesus Christ is our great high priest. But we need to know that Jesus Christ is a different kind of high priest. He's not a high priest after the order of Aaron. He is not a high priest appointed by the law of Moses. He is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he has been directly appointed by God the Father himself. The fascinating thing is that the author of the Hebrews is the only writer in the New Testament who says anything, makes any mention of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is mentioned but twice in the Old Testament. Our scripture reading that Chad read for us, and then again that great Messianic Psalm 110. But it's obvious, as you're reading through the book of Hebrews, and perhaps you've picked up on this, that the writer of Hebrews is tracking along in the Psalms. At Hebrews chapter 2, for instance, he talks to us about Psalm 2 and sees the connection of Jesus Christ with Psalm 2 as that ideal man. Reading along further, we come to where he makes a connection to Psalm 95, and now he picks up on Psalm 110. For all we know, he could have been reading the Psalms in that kind of order, and he's asking himself the question, this Psalm, this Psalm points to the Lord Jesus, but But what does it mean for Jesus to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek? And what does that mean for us? Well, Abraham, as you were listening to the Scripture reading, had gone to rescue his nephew Lot. And after a big battle, he brought Lot back and was met by the wicked king of Sodom and by another king, this man, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And on that occasion, Abraham paid tithes of the spoils of the war to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek had blessed Abraham in a remarkable way. And though the writer of Hebrews doesn't pick up on these elements in his letter, but when we heard it read, King Melchizedek brought that of bread and wine. Now, we New Testament Christians, our ears should perk up when we hear that kind of language. Well, the writer goes on to take up the words of the psalmist and to help us see the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think the best way to approach this question is by doing what 
we Presbyterians really like to do, ask questions in a catechesis sort of form. So why does he use Melchizedek as a picture of Jesus Christ? And he tells us at the end of verse 3 that this Melchizedek resembled or was made like, resembled the Son of God. So here's an answer to the question that many ask. Is Melchizedek Jesus? Well, the answer to that question is resemblance is not the same thing as identity. He resembled the Son of God. He was not the Son of God. He wasn't a pre-incarnate vision of the Christ. He was a picture. In other words, Melchizedek is Melchizedek. And he appears in Genesis 14. And what God says about him in Genesis 14 and what God does not say about him in that passage is tremendously important. First, we're told his name is Melchizedek, and it's a compound name by which you can break the name apart, in other words, into two different root sections, and you would come up with that of king and that of righteousness. So his name name essentially means king of righteousness. But notice he was also the king of Salem. Salem again, and its root coming from another word that we're familiar with, with that word of shalom, that meaning peace. In other words, his name and his place of service brings together those two important concepts, king of righteousness and king of peace. And you only have to think for just a brief moment about what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and see why this would make such a connection in the early church's mind or in a New Testament Christian's mind. For Paul writes, because we have been justified, counted righteous by faith, because of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate king of righteousness. He was made sin for us that we in turn might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And we know He too is the King of peace. He is the one who speaks peace to our conscience when we come to believe in Him. So there's this connection with this name. There's a connection also with genealogy. At verse 3, he's without father or mother, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. So what does the genealogy of Melchizedek teach us? Well, what it teaches us is that Melchizedek doesn't have a genealogy. That's the point. He appears in the book of Genesis, without father or mother being mentioned. Now you think for a moment, well, what's so special about that? Well, just read the book of Genesis, and you'll detect what's so special about that, particularly those opening 14 chapters. And you'll see that nobody who really matters appears Uh, uh, matters for the ongoing work of God and redemption, nobody who matters in that way appears in the book of uh, Genesis unless he has a genealogy. And here Melchizedek appears, as it were, out of the blue and simply disappears back into the blue in a mysterious way in the book of Genesis. What is God saying? 
Well, by what he's not saying, you can see what he is saying. Melchizedek comes like someone without a genealogy in the past and without an end in the future, just like the Son of God who came into the world, the eternal Son of the Heavenly Father who lives forever. He is undying. And that is the point. He didn't mean that Melchizedek wasn't born or that he didn't have a mom or dad or that he didn't die. He didn't mean that. But he indicates that when you read the story, you know nothing about his past. You know nothing about his future. He just seems to come and go. And so he's a wonderful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ who is without beginning and without end. He is the eternal Son of God. So in his name, in his genealogy, and then in his ministry, there is a clue to how he resembles the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a priest of the Most High God. That that must mean that somewhere after the flood, as the word of promise was held on in Noah's family, somewhere out of that stream that comes immediately to Abraham, somewhere, somehow, some way, there were people who believed in the true and living God. And this Melchizedek is one of them. Do you hear what's being said? He he isn't in the line of promise. He's outside that line. Oh, but listen. That doesn't mean that he's outside of the grace of God because he's come to believe in the living and true God. And his ministry is a remarkable ministry. He is a true and a great high priest, although he is not a descendant of the tribe of Levi. And it is his encounter with Abraham that is particularly impressive. He received tithes from Abraham, which we might say, if you think about DNA and the way it works, that even uh, the tribe of Levi, even the family of Levi's DNA was already present in Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And not only so, but look what our writer in Hebrews, how he addresses Abraham. He's wanting to paint a picture here about Abraham's importance to the early church. See how great, at verse 4, see how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, Now, he writes, the patriarch, as in, that settles the case for all the patriarchs. Abraham is the father of all patriarchs. And yet, he goes on to say, Father Abraham bowed before Melchizedek to receive the blessing of the one who was greater than himself the one who was known as the king of righteousness and the king of peace. No one in the early church, no one in the church of Israel was greater than Abraham. And yet here, Abraham bows his knee to the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Now, why this was so important, and the writer was setting this up, you remember, as we noted earlier, that 
there were some in the church who were missing all the glitz and glamour and glory of the old temple. It obviously was still standing. They were, they were being tested, tempted to go back. They were hiding out in catacombs and in house churches and back alleys trying to escape the persecution. And they were looking back at the glory that they remembered in Israel. And the writer is making the case that don't go back for that king your great patriarch bowed his knee is one made like the Son of God who is a priest forever. So in a way, the question was not so much who was Melchizedek. The issue is look at the amazing ways in this story of Genesis 14 that Melchizedek gives us a great sense of the sheer superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ over all other priests, all other apostles, all other patriarchs. And so, why is Jesus a high priest in the order of Melchizedek? And the answer is just simple, because the Old Testament priesthood of Levi didn't have the ability to bring what Jesus could, perfection. And in the book of Hebrews, the idea of perfection is, is almost equivalent to what we would call salvation to what the writer of Hebrews has been talking about earlier with they couldn't bring the people to that of rest, of eternal rest, of the forgiveness of sins, the transformation of our hearts, of a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, of an assurance of salvation, of the hope of of glory. And the writer is going to make the point in the further verses of chapter 7 that the Levitical priesthood that God had appointed could not ultimately deliver. And what we find is that these priests were lacking in permanence. They died. And a new one would be raised up, and they would die. But Jesus Christ is that great high priest who endures forever. And we don't have a situation like Israel in some respects. Our nation has turned wholly secular. And so likely people aren't going to try to find remedies and helps from the church or from priests today. Who would you say were the prophets and the priests and the kings in our world today, in particular our nation, 21st century America? Well, we don't have kings, you say, and that would be right in some respects. So who would be the political overlords? Who would be the prophets, you know, the ones scratching on the subway walls and tenement halls as the music group sang? pop stars, the Twitter accounts, the media pundits, they tell us what to believe and what to think. The political parties, they would be those overlords. Who then would be the priests today in our culture? 
psychiatrist, the counselors, the psychologists, the people to whom you go when you're troubled and in need and guilty and life's turned upside down. But, but they, in some respects, they're just like the Old Testament priests. They're ultimately powerless to forgive your sins and transform your lives. Oh, they may prescribe medications that will balance your body chemistry or give you breathing space until you get your life back in some kind of equilibrium. But what is being overlooked today at the root of everything that troubles man? And may God in His mercies grant us the ability to see this. What is at the root of everything is the way that we repress our alienation from God. And we hold it down and we try to hide it underneath all the troubles in our lives. And this knowledge that we were created for eternity and still we have not found pardon, uh, peace, and forgiveness. And all of these Secular workers are ultimately powerless to help us. But that's why this is so hopeful for us is because we have a priest who endures forever. And we can go to him and find that rest, find that peace, find that hope. No, most of us would not turn to priest in this world, nor would most of our culture. Oh, but we're searching. We're looking for that thing that gives us that ultimate peace and hope. And that's why this picture of Melchizedek is so vital for us. Because thousands of years before we were ever a twinkle in anyone's eyes, God painted a picture that we could see the truthfulness of who this one who would be the ultimate enduring priest. Because he reminds us the law cannot save. Those priests were powerless. The world cannot save. Their priests are powerless. But this one can save the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in Him, and you will find the hope, the peace, the sense of full life that you long for. Let's pray. Oh God and our Father, we thank You for this picture. We grope in this world trying to find things, people who can help us put everything together in our lives and when all is quiet and we're all alone that we have a sense of peace. Father, none of these things can ultimately provide that peace. We saw it in the Old Testament. The law could not do that. The apostles could not do that. The great high priest could not do that. And all the while, you've painted for us the picture of one who could. And then he burst on the scene only to be crucified by us. But because He is the great high priest who endures forever, death could not hold Him. And He has risen to defeat death and sin and the devil. And so in the darkness of the night, in the loneliness of the moment, in the quietness of the hour, when our hearts beat against us, 
the one who is our great high priest, simply says, peace, be still. And as we look to him, even with everything around us swirling, there's a peace that cannot be altered. And we thank you. May we be a people who trust in this one called Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.